Nick Bostrom's paper, Astronomical Waste, proposes that in principle, an advanced post-human civilization could run enormous numbers of simulations of happy human or other advanced minds, and that this would be a very, in his eyes, morally valuable state of affairs. Many other transhumanists have advanced similar kinds of proposals for creating cosmological eudaimonia through spreading simulated happy lives throughout the cosmos. Unfortunately, it's not at all clear that this kind of utopian outcome will be realized. There are many other scenarios in which either humans lose control of the future, or even if humans do control the future, the future is quite bad for the sentient beings within it. But let's suppose that we do have a future controlled by human moral values. Would that future still contain suffering? So one answer could be that, yes, there would still be potentially suffering at a low level, such as in the subroutines and robots that keep the civilization running and implement the civilization's strategy and growth trajectory. But let's focus just on higher level minds that are directly created for their intrinsic value to their creators. Even before the development of transhumanism, there has been a long literature on the topic of creators and his or her creations, namely theology. And so one of the classic problems in theology is the problem of evil, the question of why a morally good God would allow for the existence of evil in the world. This page suggests that the most common explanation of why there's evil in the world is the free will theodicy, or as a response to the logical problem of evil, the free will defense. Possibly the strongest version of the free will defense is that by Alvin Plantinga. Many consider that Plantinga's defense has sufficiently rebutted the logical problem of evil. So the basic idea is that in order for God to create a world with creatures who are significantly free, God has to not intervene in those creatures' choices. And not intervening means that they may freely choose to do evil at some times. And that's why there may be evil in the world. And if you think that allowing creatures freedom is more important than preventing cruelty, then it might be that there's a morally good God who nonetheless allow, allows evil in the world. So my hope is that most Christians who embrace this argument do so in part just to show the logical possibility of evil in the world, not because they think it's a likely explanation, or even if they do think it's a likely explanation, maybe it's just a way to resolve their cognitive dissonance. In other words, it's a way to believe that there is a morally good God despite the evil in the world. And if they subsequently realized that there was no biblical God, then maybe they would abandon this kind of moral view. But there seems to be a significant possibility that some people would retain this kind of idea that freedom is more important than not suffering. And we see this today in the form of libertarian impulses, where libertarians may believe that it's more important to allow autonomous action than it is to prevent the worst off in society from suffering. So it's not at all guaranteed that people would not follow the path that Plantinga suggests that God may have followed when they create their simulations. One argument that some have responded to Plantinga with is that it might be possible for God to allow people free choice, but essentially set the initial conditions of the simulation in such a way that people would, by their own volition, choose the right actions. So the way I think about this is violating free will would be pausing a simulation and basically editing the state of the simulation world to prevent bad things from happening. Whereas allowing free will would be meaning that the simulation runs its course, but maybe you can set the initial conditions or parameters such that when it does run its course, it runs its course in a good way. So one problem with this is that unlike a hypothetical god, simulators are not actually omniscient. In order to figure out what the results of a simulation would be, they need to actually run the simulation because simulations are very complex systems with potentially butterfly effects. And so this process of running lots of simulations with lots of initial conditions in order to find some initial conditions that conduce to less suffering, um, all the other simulations that you tried would themselves contain lots of suffering, and so that's a pretty bad outcome as well.
rather than running lots of simulations with lots of initial conditions to find conditions that conduce to less freely chosen cruelty. Another approach could be to design the characters in the simulation in such a way that they are altruistic and nice and compassionate. So they live in a cooperative society and whenever somebody gets hurt, they immediately come to the rescue. This is basically the argument that J.L. Mackey has made. He said that um, free will is not a defense of evil because God could have created creatures who freely choose to do the right things. This may be called the good choosing argument. This would be, in my opinion, a good measure to take and it would result in less suffering. There still might be pain due to natural injuries, um, although maybe the environment could be made less injurious as well. C.S. Lewis argues in The Problem of Pain that because different organisms share a common environment, it's going to be rare that any two organisms get exactly what they want at the same time. For example, he says, even if a pebble lies where I want it to lie, it cannot, except by coincidence, be where you want it to lie. So assuming you've got sufficient diversity of the organisms such that they have different preferences about the environment, then there will be some unsatisfied preferences, perhaps necessarily. But um, if you have a sufficiently cooperative and peaceful society, then at least those differences can be reduced, and one hopes that they would not result in unbearable forms of suffering. So even if these kinds of arguments suggest that a simulated utopia couldn't be suffering-free, there's probably a lot of room to reduce the worst forms of suffering around the edges, and that's something that suffering reducers should push for. But I fear that everyone might not go along with this, and one reason is if we look at fiction. In this piece, Eliezer Yudkowsky explains how good stories contain conflict, or stories are about people's pain, or every scene must end in disaster. And Yudkowsky himself wrote stories when he was young, that were more happy and easily resolved, and those stories were less interesting. So insofar as what people intrinsically value in a simulation is analogous to what people intrinsically value in an interesting story, then there might be people who would object to making society just nice and without conflict among selfish agents. Yudkowsky proposes what I think is a reasonable compromise, namely get rid of the Inquisition and get rid of the worst forms of suffering that people experience, but keep maybe mild pain or maybe even the pain of breaking up with a lover um, in order to preserve some of the emotional richness that human life has. But I fear that some people would not even go this far and might even keep more intense forms of suffering, perhaps as a way to provide a contrast for the value of overcoming that intense suffering. Moreover, if there are simulations that require a long, unbroken chain of events starting from when an intelligent civilization first evolved all the way through its spacefaring trajectory, then those kinds of simulations would very likely contain cruelty because it's very common for evolved creatures to be selfish and to inflict harm on others for their own benefit. So if some people insisted on running those kinds of simulations, they would very likely contain significant amounts of intense suffering. Some other potential reasons why post-humans might not eliminate inclinations toward evil in their creations have been discussed in the theological literature, such as that overcoming real temptations is necessary for making moral choices, or that virtues become less meaningful if there's not a potential contrast. Antony Flew discusses a similar point, the idea that certain virtues require certain evils. For example, in order to have a second order good of sympathy, you at least need the appearance of first order evils like pain. In fact, we can make a more general point, which is that any attempt to explain the problem of evil is a potential way in which post-human simulators might themselves introduce evil if they agree with the premise underlying that explanation. So, for example, if evil is a way to refine the character of people so that they can become more virtuous or better people in the long term, then that's a potential way in which 
simulators with certain values might also inflict the same evil on their creatures. In conclusion, I would suggest two broad takeaways from this discussion. One is that even a so-called utopian future in which human moral values control what happens in the far future of a superintelligent civilization, there may be non-trivial suffering created within the intrinsically valued simulations, depending on the moral values of those deciding what the contents should be. And the second point is that it seems important to promote the idea that reducing suffering is more important than other values, especially values like free will, letting nature run its course, or creating complex, unpredictable simulation worlds of autonomous agents, because those kinds of unpredictable, uncontrolled simulations are more likely to contain the cruelty and otherwise intense pain that we see in our present world.